I really like um, daytime clubbing now. I can't stop dancing. <laughs> Christmas Famous used to come in the Smash Hits office, nice outside the record player, and he would, he would stand dancing by the record player. <laughs> everyone, everyone liked this fact. The starting point for this album was the end of the last album, um, which is called Electric. It was produced by Stuart Price. We recorded all the songs in alphabetical order. So the final song was called Vocal. And it was our favourite track on the album. And it was very, what you might call, banging. And we decided with the follow-up album to that, Super, we were going to begin where we'd left off with the last album by trying to make a series of very banging, um, very electronic pop songs that you could dance to. This album and the last album are the only records we ever made that didn't have other musicians or strings or guitarists um, on them. So what's really happened to us in the last few years is we've become electronic purists. I think we've sort of subconsciously plundered dance music from the past without really thinking too much about it. So there's a track later on the album which sort of ha has a trance feel to it. And I think it's probably harking back to, you know, happy times of, you know, being in clubs with your mates. We actually wrote the songs in Berlin and London, but in writing the songs, we also have started making the record because Chris is doing all the programming. We record the vocals. So, so when we've gone through that process, we hand Stuart, in this instance, 14 songs that have all been recorded by us, and then he starts to work on what we've done. Stuart Price has um, kind of grown up listening to the Pet Shop Boys, so he understands us very well probably knows more about us than we do. And we work very well together. There's a great, you know, great atmosphere in the studio, a lot of fun making the records, and we, we get off on the same kind of things, and there's a sort of great sense of um, euphoria in the studio when things are working well, and that's, that sort of is reflected in the music that we make together. Super was Chris's idea, and that's, that's, what, that's what you said. I did. <laughs> yeah, this came on quite late in the day, this title Super. I think it works because the album's very sort of shiny and pop and everything, and Super implies a sort of pop aesthetic. We had a couple of other titles, which I, one of which I thought was really good. Um, another one... We felt, We're not saying we, it because we, well, like we still quite like it. We still quite like it. But our manager didn't, didn't like it at all. She thought it had unfortunate connotations. Yes. Um. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to intrigue everyone. Yeah. <laughs> London has changed completely. Um, the London of West End Girls is now the London of 20-something. When we first started writing songs together in the early 80s, London was um, a much more bohemian place. Now, in the world of 20-something, London's a place that's about, a lot of it's just about money and it's harder. I don't know if that reflects stylistically on the actual content of the music, but it probably reflects in the, in the lyrics, because so many of the lyrics are observational. Uh, and I spend so much time, we both do actually, on the street. Um, I, you know, I walk through London every day I'm here, and, um, and that's why I get a lot of inspiration from that. I think two Northerners could come to London and form the electronic music duo now because in some ways it's easier to make electronic music now. When we started in 1981, I mean, we had, I had a, a synthesizer, Korg MS-10, I just bought, which is one of those ones with plugs and everything in. Nowadays we have a, we have a, a digital version of that as a piece of software on, the, on one of the computers. And likewise, to go into a recording studio in those days was very, very expensive. And nowadays, you can just do it at home, in your, famously in your bedroom. And um, so I think, I think it still is possible. But I think maybe it's even in some ways easier. You're probably more likely to be a solo artist though now because, because everything's done in the computer. 
I mean, we used to say that the duo made sense because you didn't need the drummer and the bass player. But now you don't really need anybody apart from your self and your, and your massive ego um, to have success nowadays. Yeah, back in the 80s, you always wanted to have the biggest snare you could possibly get. Um, we spent ages working on snare sounds. Ages, yeah. Um, and then drums went small again. Back to little 909. Um, and bass sounds got bigger. And bass sounds got bigger. Yeah. It was a lot easier back then because, of, I mean, there were only a couple of drum machines and you just we just used to use the Lindrum and we didn't think about using anything else. But now you've got so much choice that you have to think about what it is that you actually want to say about your drum sound. As ever with our albums, you know, they're a sort of a one function they have as a picture of the world at the time they're made. And we, no one can deny we live in a very narcissistic age of uh, selfies and social media and reality TV and tweets and humble brags and all the rest of it. And Groovy is a sort of celebration of that, really, I think. It's, it's a great moment when you hear what, what um, Neil's going to sing over something. Sometimes it goes completely against what the music is, which works, and sometimes it kind of goes with it. And on the Groovy, for instance, um, it really sort of goes with, with the music. But my comments are very few and far between. They're not that few and far between. <laughs> also, I know there's a kind of lyric that I know Chris likes. Everything about tonight feels right and so young. Everything I'd want to say out loud could, could be sung. It's in the music. It's in the song. It likes. Yeah, it can't be that. <laughs> I like, it. I like it when it's um, a totally shared experience where we all yeah. feel the same thing. Yeah, when we put Inner Sanctima as a sort of teaser track for the album, um, it was a sort of, a, a, you know, to give an idea of the album as a dance album. Again, it's very Pet Shop Boys. Do we believe the person singing the song is going to get into the Inner Sanctum? Or, and is the inner sanctum worth getting into in the, anyway when you get there? I, I'm not convinced it is personally. So I think it's the dream of EDM that you're in the best bit of the best club with the best people, with the best alcohol, etc. And and um, and you've made it. Pazzo is Italian for crazy, and I had some. I have some Italian friends, and uh, they used to. Um, described me as Pazzo all the time and I didn't bother to look at what it meant, I just thought it must be quite a nice term, <laughs> term of endearment and um, I just liked the word and then when I didn't realise what it was I thought oh you could write a track that was just crazy and um, a dance track and it was just a, it was just an eight bar loop on one note and something really, I think something like that you get in this album that's quite appealing is quite a, a level of moronicness through it and staying on one note for the entire song with just noises coming in and snare fills it's um so it's, it's um, i find that quite appealing but we always think something that's moronically catchy is a, just a piece of a look really um it's just pure inspiration you can't intellectualize it you can't work your way to it through some kind of thought process it just like appears out of nowhere For the lovers of Pet Shop Boys Slowies, there's a few mounting up that will come out at some point. Um, but Sad Robot World, there was a discussion about it being on the album, but we decided to have it on because it's a, such an electronic sounding track and a sort of electronic music theme about robots. And this was inspired by going to the Volkswagen factory at Autostadt in Wolfsburg, Germany. We were given a guided tour of the, the factory and towards the end there's a bit where um, the cars are ne nearly been, they have been put together from different parts and robots wash them like this and, um, and there was something sort of rather balletic and melancholy about it and I remarked at the time I said God it's like a sad robot world. And, um, and I remembered this phrase. And actually, if you just put this music, this song over 
a film of the Volkswagen robots, it would be, it'd be perfect. This song, it, it was very nice, and very, it sounded lovely on electronic instruments. And, and I started to sing a sort of Brian Ferry-ish thing over it called Why Do I Love You? And Chris actually thought it was too wet. Um, so he carried on working on the track and I flicked through the, I don't want to go like that because it's all on my phone. Um, Flick through the archive, see what I had, and then I said, Oh, the dictator. It was usually called the sad dictator. And I'd written this lyric as a poem, really. Um, and I just had the idea that you get these dictators in the world, like in North Korea or in Syria, where they've inherited their positions from their father or from their family. And they're sort of trapped. And actually, and and I just had this sort of slightly whimsical idea that supposing the dictator, like all of his subjects, wanted to be free as well. And anyway, I'd written this entire thing, it was all written, and I realised it, it, it fitted the music. And so I said, oh, well, let's try this idea. And Chris said, oh yeah, that's better. Well, actually the Royal Opera House wanted the Pet Shop Boys to do a thing at the Royal Opera House, and they've been asking us for years now. You know, we, we've always liked to have a major event on the go, like, performing Battleship at Temkin in Trafalgar Square and all the rest of it. And this, this is very much in that kind of uh, lineage. There might be a lot of um, smoke and mirrors, literally. Literally smoke, literally and, smoke mirrors. and mirrors. <laughs>